Welcome to the Relationship Recovery Podcast, hosted by Jessica Knight, a certified life coach who specializes in narcissistic and emotional abuse. This podcast is intended to help you identify manipulative and abusive behavior, set boundaries with yourself and others, and heal the relationship with yourself so you can learn to love in a healthy way. Hello, thanks for being here. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a few announcements. And so first, the Relationship Recovery Program, which is my course, self-paced course to help you understand if it's an emotional abusive relationship or not, to begin to understand the cycle and the trauma bond, and to also set boundaries so you can begin to heal and look forward to the next steps of healing. That course now includes a one-on-one validation call with me that you can bring anything to. There's really nothing that you can't ask and that you can't seek feedback on, and it'll be scheduled at a time that works for you. The second thing is that I'm going to be giving a live version of that course on January 28th. You can sign up on my website, emotionalabusecoach.com. That is going to be from 9 a.m. Eastern to 2 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to go through the entire relationship recovery course and we'll have time for Q&A. There'll be a way for you to anonymously ask questions if you're not comfortable asking them to the group. And it'll be a day to begin to start your healing journey. The last thing is that I am starting a trauma bond recovery course in February. Details will be out soon. And if you are curious about what that all entails, feel free to send me an email, jessica at jessicanightcoaching.com or just stay tuned for details. I most likely will release it on Instagram first. I have been soliciting questions on Instagram. I found a way to anonymously ask for questions so that way people don't feel like they had to reply to my story or that somebody could see it. And so... I'm going to go through some questions today, and I hope that it's helpful to hear what other people are asking, because I'm sure you've had a similar question too. And so this is the first one. Is calling names, pointing fingers, and degrading me during a fight or when things go wrong abuse? Why do they pretend it's all well during the calm cycle? I'm just so tired of this. How does one get out? I'm so conflicted. And so calling names, pointing fingers and degrading during a fight is abuse. That's absolutely abuse. Anything that's not nurturing is abuse. And they pretend that it's well in the calm cycle because they think they pulled one over on you. Most likely your boundaries have been not firm. And so when they get to calm, they think it's all fine. You know, they're getting affirmation from you. But what happens once you start to understand that you're in the cycle of abuse is that the calm cycle actually becomes really uncomfortable for you because you know what's happening and you know what comes next, the tension building. But when they're in calm, they're not aware that now it's the calm and then the tension's going to start building again because that's just their natural cycle. But you're likely going to be so on edge that you're there. And so how does one get out? That's really what my course does. The relationship recovery course, it helps you figure out if it's abuse and start to set enough boundaries so that you can begin to think clearly so you can get out. But my quick answer to that is to start developing a plan. Obviously, it looks differently if you have children with the person, if you're married to the person, and if, or if you don't. If you have children, I would meet with a lawyer and I would go through a free consultation and ask all the questions you need to ask. I would ask the financial questions. I would ask about what divorce looks like. And I would really start to get your facts straight. When I did that for myself, I met with a lawyer and a mediator to try and understand what it looked like on both ends. And I chose to go with the lawyer. If you're not married to the person, if there is no child, then just start preparing to leave. If you don't live together, then it is about beginning to create space so that you can leave the relationship. If you live together, I would start thinking about where you're going to go. If 
you're financially dependent on them, I would work to start getting not financially dependent on them. There's various ways that you can do that. If you don't have a job, you can still ask for support. You can raise money. You can ask people to send you money that you can hold on to it. Obviously, you can also get a job. You know, I know that everybody's circumstance is different, but I would prepare to leave. I would start setting those things in motion. I would no longer agree to trips with the person. I would no longer agree to go on a vacation. I would push things off so that way you could start to figure out what you're going to do. The next question is, I love the relationship recovery course. Did you know you always wanted to do this? Yes. I became a life coach when I was in my young 20s because one, life coaching wasn't really regulated then. It's not regulated that much right now, but back then it was even less. And so I was coaching yoga instructors on teaching yoga because I had such a hard time speaking in front of the room. I then started working with women going through a quarter life crisis or millennial life crisis like that 20 to 30 point where you just didn't know what you were doing anymore or how to do it. And then after that, I started to attract more people in toxic relationships before I even knew the word narcissist, before I even understood understood abuse, emotional abuse. And then as I healed from my own marriage and as I healed from a toxic relationship after that, I learned a lot of the wording, a lot of the terminology and got certified in it. And just to be clear, I am a certified coach. Um, I became certified in 2015. I am a part of the ICF, which is the overseeing coaching body. And I'm also a trauma-informed, narcissistic, and emotional abuse coach. So that's a really long answer to say, yes, I knew I always wanted to do this. Question three, is it normal that I'm suddenly obsessed with learning more about narcissism since I see these traits in my husband? Yes very normal. So I feel like for a lot of us, when we actually learn about narcissism for the first time or abuse for the first time, it's like this onion that just keeps peeling. Like there's so many layers to it. And it, and almost like you never stop learning about it, but once you see it, you can't unsee it. Like, you you know, once you start to see some of the traits and some of the behaviors, it's not like you're going to be like, Oh, well he was a narcissist yesterday, but he's not today. Like he's there a narcissist or they have narcissistic qualities rather. That's probably a better way to say it because only 1% of narcissists are diagnosed. So it's easier to say this person has narcissistic qualities because we all have narcissistic qualities. Like I have narcissistic qualities. Every single person does, but it really depends on like, are you aware of that? Do you have 25 narcissistic qualities or do you have two? You know, like it's like really getting involved with how does this person treat me? How do they act? But learning the terminology learning what happens, learning kind of the rules of the game is really important to begin to separate yourself from it. Question four, he's trying to hoover me back after I went no contact, but I can't help but feeling guilty. So I understand. And it can be really tough because usually they hoover in a way that makes you feel like they are trying to meet you where you are and that they understand and that they are sorry. But just to be clear, they're not. If they haven't done work on themselves and they're just trying to get you back to get you back, it might even feel like you're just an addiction to be met by them in some way. And so if that's happening, you can allow that part to feel guilty. It can be sad to say no to someone. That's okay. You can feel sad. You can feel down. You can feel bummed. You can feel like you're letting yourself and him down. But You also probably have a part of you that is just so tired of this, that didn't want to go through all the pain that you went through to finally be hoovered back in. And I would let that part have a say for a little while. Let that part have some feelings, feel new feelings. If you're used to allowing it to come in, if you're used to feeling guilty, try to let the guilt come. Like try and tell yourself it's okay to feel guilty, that sometimes it's okay to feel guilty and that you can have that feeling, but you can also have the feeling of not wanting to go back to the toxicity. Question five, I'm fresh out of an insanely toxic, abusive in every way relationship and I can't stop cycling through the good memories. How do I make it stop? I want to call him. So this happened to me too. And when I was fresh out of the relationship, I like addictively would call my ex and, or find ways to talk to him. And I just couldn't stop. And 
what I had to do is I had to begin to see it like it was an addiction and that I just was so used to having this like really toxic affirmation or very toxic version of love. And I decided that I didn't want it anymore. And that regardless of how painful it was that I wanted to heal past it, that that meant more to me, that I couldn't imagine going back to the relationship. So I also needed to work on the boundaries that I had when I was leaving it. But I let myself feel those feelings. And I think sometimes we run away from those feelings and it's okay to miss them. It's okay to have good memories. I have a lot of good memories with my ex. A lot of them are kind of tainted now because when I look back, I can see the full cycle, but like I hiked Mount Washington with him in New Hampshire and it was a great day. It was like one of the best days hitting the top of that mountain and just sitting and like feeling good about it. I went to my first music festival with him and had a blast. I did a lot of fun things with him, but there also were times that were not fun. And there were plenty more times that felt like I was completely lost for myself. And then as the relationship went on, those memories, every single one became tainted as I looked at them. But you can still have those memories and they can be yours. You can just not want them in the way that you have them anymore. You don't want to have to go through what you went through in order to have those good memories. Question six. I found out last night that my narc ex is now engaged to a new girl. While I'm still recovering from all the trauma he caused me, all the plans we made that he threw away so easily. Do you have any advice? I was doing better until this pushed me down again. So if that person did not go to therapy, which I'm imagining they haven't, then this is just their new supply. This is their new person that's making them feel amazing. They likely have love bombed them. This person has not seen the toxic sides of them yet. I would truly just see it for what it is in the narcissistic abuse cycle that here, okay, I'm discarded now. And now he's going on, like he's immediately in a relationship and I'm here. It's like, okay, there's a lot of healing for you to do. And it has absolutely nothing to do with them. The benefit, which I know doesn't feel like a benefit, is that now his attention will be on something and someone else and it won't be hoovering you back in. And I know that sucks. But the benefit is that you can really focus on your healing and healing through this abuse and getting to the other side and trust and know that he has not changed. I promise you that. I would put every dollar in my bank account on it right now. He has not changed. And this isn't going to be any different than what you went through. And you don't want that. Think about where that relationship would have gone and if you could have lived with that forever. And I doubt you could have. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stress and trauma happen inside of our bodies. So we can't just heal them through talking. We must also heal them through feeling. My name is Luis Mojica. I'm a somatic educator and nutritionist, and I'm also the host of the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where every week I teach you how to release stress and trauma and find a safety inside of yourself through nutrition, self-inquiry, and somatic experiencing. Join me over at the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast or visit me at holisticlifenavigation.com. Question seven, I'm having a hard time accepting that what happened to me is emotional abuse. Other people have had it worse than me. My situation, my situation has caused me a lot of anxiety and depression. Any advice? First of all, there's no level of bad that it's not like, oh, that was worse than this one or this one was this and this. Like we do in coaching, sometimes say highly abusive or highly manipulative or like where on the scale does it fall? It doesn't mean that it doesn't affect, have a huge effect on you. And if you have anxiety and depression, but you don't have a broken wrist, it doesn't mean that you had it less bad. It's still really bad. Anxiety and depression is still really hard to live with and really hard to work through. So I would accept it because, or I would find a way to accept it through validating your own experience. Because I always say the first thing you need to do when beginning to heal 
is getting right with reality. What's the reality? The reality is that this was abuse. I'm sure if I gave you a list of signs of abuse, you could look at it and you'd say, okay, I have, you know, I don't know, 19 out of 31 signs. Like that's a lot. So it doesn't matter if it's less bad or like what, what that even means. Abuse is abuse. Question eight, can you heal from a trauma bond if you stay with the same person who caused it? No. And the answer is no, because you're basically saying, can I make the abusive person not abusive? And I would have done anything in my relationship to change that. I would have done anything to make that man be less abusive and to be the person that I knew he could be because I saw it sometimes and I inflated it more times. I would have done anything for that. You can't heal a trauma bond while keep being abused. That like part of healing your trauma bond is getting to the point of no contact because you need to get to that point of fully separating from the person since it's, it's incredibly painful, but it's really important if you want to truly begin to heal from the abuse that you're going through. And you can only re-enter that relationship if that other person went on their own healing journey. So the way that I would see that look and I have never seen this work, not once, but the way that I would see that work is that you did your work and you healed and you had, you understood what your boundaries are and what you accept and what you don't accept and how you want to be treated. And they went and they understood how they were abusive. They understood that what abuse looks like and what they can't do anymore. And they had somebody there to support them every time that they blamed you for something that had absolutely nothing to do, to do with you and had everything to do with them. That takes a long time. Then you could refind each other and then maybe it would be a different relationship. But I have never seen that. It matters more that you focus on your healing and what's best for you. What's your highest and best? Question nine, is it normal to care about my narcissistic ex that I hope they get the proper mental health? I've got no contact and do not intend to contact, but I want to urge and plead for them to get help. So I remember being in this place and I, similar to like what I just said, I would have done anything for them to actually like go get help. I, I actually gave him like more than one ultimatum to go to therapy and I know that something, you know, there's probably, probably I'm going to say 50% of the people listening to this are like, oh, you can't do that. Well, it wasn't as bad as that sounds. It wasn't like you have to go to therapy for me to be with you. It was, I can't be with you. I can't do this anymore. Okay. What will it take for you to be with me? I don't know. I can't, I just know I can't do this anymore. And like, I'm losing myself and okay. What if I go to therapy? If you go to therapy, then I'll give it a try but you have to go this time. It can't just be words. Okay, I'll go. No, but you really have to go this time. That's what it was like. And he had ultimatums for me too. And which weren't like that one, but I, he never went. And it wasn't something that I was like, so where are we today? Like today, it's been 17 days since you promised therapy for the fifth time. Where are we? It was more like a conscious thing that I knew that it wasn't happening. And then when we broke up, that was the first thing on my list was he needs to go to therapy. He needs to work on this, but I had to let that go. And he had reached out a few times. And every time I said, did he go to therapy? Like I either asked somebody or I could tell based on how he was talking to me and it was still a no. And it's still a no to this day. So you can hope and wish all the things for them. They're going to have to do it when they do it. And it might be that they never do it, but you can wish them the best and wish them the healing without having to talk to them. Question 10. My narc ex somehow still knows everything I'm doing and is now accusing me of stealing his friends. We're supposed to be at a wedding this weekend and he lied and said they didn't want me there. So I opted not to go. Is this normal behavior? Will he stop? So this is called a smear campaign. That is something that happens in narcissistic abuse. And so 
the narc will go around and he will start spreading, like making you into the crazy person, the liar, the abuser, the whatever. It's intended to make you feel crazy, which it does. And then it's also intended to kind of turn people against you. And so the best thing that you can do is to not go to situations where you're going to be around them because you're just going to be triggered. So that can be just a personal boundary that you have of, I don't go to events that he's going to be at. Another thing that you can do is understand that your friends are your friends. And so if they're your friends, you can have some private conversations with them and explain to them what's going on. I remember I did this at the beginning of my breakup. I went to a friend and like this, I knew that I was being abused and I knew that I didn't want to go back, but I also was really distant. And I went to a mutual friend that we had and I just said, I'm losing my mind. And, you know, we had all these mutual plans together. And I just said, like, I can't go to them, but I want to meet, like, I can we talk? And she was like, absolutely, we could talk. And like, we got on the phone and basically she was like, um, none of this behavior is okay. Like nothing that you've just told me that has happened is okay. And I was like, and it was like other things, like other things that I didn't mention or other things she didn't know about. And like, it was really validating for me to be able to say that. And so that they understood where my boundaries were. And I believe that she, you know, she probably wanted to be friends with both of us. And I actually chose to remove myself because I didn't want to be in the toxicity and I didn't think it'd be healthy for me to continue to hear about him. I've had other clients that have just kind of taken breaks from friends, but if they're really your friends, they'll understand. If they're true friends, they'll understand that you need some space, that you need a break, that you don't want to be around him. And so you may want to think about who in this group are my allies that I can open up to a little bit and tell them what I'm going through and what I'm scared about. I think this is question 11. I don't know. I lost count at this point. My narcissistic spouse makes me extremely anxious and I've developed high blood pressure and a fast heart rate, but he says I just have anxiety issues. Is it normal to have physical symptoms of emotional abuse? 1000% because it is affecting every part of you, right? If you're anxious, if you're depressed, if like the mind and the body work together, So yes, a lot of physical things can develop as a result of dealing with this because you're so stressed, right? You're in fight or flight a lot of the time. So a hundred thousand percent, don't let them gaslight you into believing that it's something else. It's possible, completely possible that you were anxious before, but it's marbly triple heightened now. Question 12, can emotional abusers change? The second podcast that I've done ever on this podcast is about that. It's called Can an Emotionally Abusive Partner Change? Go listen to that podcast. I could talk right now about the answer. The answer is no, but go listen to that. And it's episode two. I will link it in the show notes of this podcast. And I think it'll be really helpful for you because that's probably about a 15 minute podcast breaking down that question. Okay. Question 13, and I'm going to end with this one and I'll do another one of these probably in about a month. So if you have questions, you can email them to Jessica at jessicanightcoaching.com. You can Instagram DM me at emotional abuse coach, or next time I throw up the anonymous bubble can just pop it in there. Question 13. I'm afraid to be alone. Have you dated again? Yes, but only one person. So I was in a marriage that was very toxic. And due to the fact that it's still quite a toxic relationship, I don't want to say more about that here. If you're in my situation, you could fill in the blanks, I'm sure. And then I had an emotionally abusive relationship that was really bad. And after that, I knew I needed to heal, but I knew I needed that because my last, when I left my marriage, I took two years off from dating relationships, sex, any of it, even dating apps, like everything, because I needed time to heal. Like in caps, I was in survival mode. I didn't even know what putting makeup on was at that point. Like my hair was always in a messy bun. 
and I needed to create space for myself. And so it took until about COVID for me to be able to find that version of me again and to feel like I could be me again because, you know, COVID shut everything down. I sort of had to face myself a bit and face my reality and push myself. I was doing a lot of inner work. So I was working with a coach at the time and I was trying to get to the point of dating. Like we sort of had a goal that like by doing some more inner work and inner healing by month three, I was hoping that I'd even be comfortable like signing up for a dating app and I got there. And then when I met my ex, that was like many months after that time. But when that relationship ended, I was like, I, nope, I don't want, I'm done. I remember telling a client that my most perfect partner could be walking down the street right now. And I wouldn't even care because I wouldn't be looking up to see them. I did not care. I did not think about it, but I'm also not afraid to be alone. I've been alone in a lot of different capacities my whole life. Like I felt extremely alone growing up. I think I have a safety in being alone. I'm not afraid to be alone. And it can be a detriment. It can be a strength. It can be a detriment because it's easy for me to isolate myself. It's easy for me to say no to things. It's easy for me to withdraw from some social stuff. But it's a positive at the same time because I can take that time that I need to heal and not feel like I'm afraid of not being with somebody. But if you are afraid of not being with somebody, then I encourage you even more to do the inner work, to be able to have that sense of center so that you don't feel needy for somebody else, that you don't feel like you have to have a partner in order to be okay. Because especially if you're prone to relationships like these, like I was, you're going to want to have the ability to say, this does not work for me. I'm leaving. Or even just having like to pick up the red flags in the beginning, like if somebody's love bombing the shit out of you, you're like, okay, we need to slow this down. And that they respect it. If they don't, then you know what you're getting yourself into. But having that aloneness and not needing that constant affirmation will help you. And so the last thing I'll say about that is that when I did meet my current partner, he is somebody that I knew from my past. I had done some work in bars for a long time and he worked at one of them that I was running events at. And he and I connected, like I was basically, at, I'm a big football fan. So I was at the bar, at a bar, screaming at the TV. And he remembered me and I, like, we just started chatting about nothing. And then I introduced myself and he was like, I know who you are, Jess. Like, are you kidding me? And I was like, ah, I didn't think you remembered me. And that night, like, you know, I gave him my number because we were like, oh, we should stay in touch. And we did we were like texting about the snow day, like the next week. And it just sort of snowballed because we have a lot of mutual friends. So it snowballed into something that was bigger. And he, I was very uncomfortable in the beginning. And I told him that. So I said that I said, I'm extremely uncomfortable and I'm not ready. And I had a lot of breakdowns in the beginning. I think for about three months, I was anxious. And then eventually either we talked through stuff or I just started to like, my system was calm, you know? And that's something that my family saw when they saw me. It was like that they were used to seeing me heightened and on edge. And I wasn't like that with him. I was calm, even though I was scared. Like I told him, I said, you know, I was just came out of a really toxic relationship. It was emotionally abusive. I'm terrified to be in a relationship with somebody. I'm hyper independent. Like I have no time to really date right now. I've done all this work on my business. And he was like, that's fine. I'll wait three weeks to go out on on a date with you. Or that's fine. I'm fine seeing you once a week. And he's never not been respectful of my work. He's never not been respectful of my child or parenting. He listens. And when we talk, I'm not going to say that we haven't fought because we have. And I'm not going to say that all those fights go perfectly, but they have been minimal. And when I feel uneasy after, he typically unless he's still kind of heightened, will talk to me about it too. So I don't think that I would have been with anybody else. If I think that if I didn't run into him in that way, I would have taken more time to see and to think about what I need and what I want. But I also think at the same time, I probably would have prolonged it forever because the fear would have taken over. And I don't talk about that often. I don't talk about what it's like to kind of date after a situation like this, but 
I get questions about it a lot from clients. And so I'll think about doing a few more episodes on that. All right. Lucky number 13. I hope that these were helpful. Like I said, there's a lot of ways you can get in touch with me. Instagram at emotional abuse coach. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can comment below with other questions. You can email me, jessica at jessicanightcoaching.com. You can download canned responses for toxic partners by going to my website, emotionalabusecoach.com. That's also the place that you can find my upcoming workshop on January 28th, as well as the course, the relationship recovery course. Thank you for listening. And I really hope that this was helpful for you.